Welcome to Our Kids in Mind. I'm Jane Gilmore. And I'm Bettina Honan. We wrote the incredible Teenage Brain book because we wanted to make neuroscience accessible to the adult supporting teens so that the young people in their care could have a better future. Bettina and I firmly believe in the power of conversation. As Dan Siegel said, conversation is a sorting place for ideas. And so with that in mind, we've reached out to other JKP authors and put our shared passion for young people's well-being at the heart of our conversation. In each podcast episode, as we marinate in our guests' expertise, we build bridges between our respective books and debate different approaches. So join our conversation as we dip into some incredible books about young people. And today we are so pleased to welcome Dr. Dawn Hebner. Dawn, welcome. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. No, such a pleasure. Dawn is a parent coach and the author of 10 books for children, including bestsellers such as What to Do When You Worry Too Much and Outsmarting Worry. Her books are practical, they're engaging, and they, she has sold well over a million copies and it's been, they've been translated into 23 languages. Her newest book, The Sibling Survival Guide, speaks with warmth and humour to children struggling to get along. So uh, I have to say, I was really so thrilled to be interviewing you, Dawn, because I have been recommending your books to families and kids that I work with for literally years. I just think they're just such an incredible resource um, for the work that we do in mental health. Thank you. Um, so just the the first question, really. I mean, one of the things that Jane and I are really passionate about, uh, you know, with, with the incredible Teenage Brain book is kind of sharing neuroscience um, to the adults caring for teens. You know, we want to try to help adults to shape the environment the best way for young people. Your books are written for children to read themselves. So we wanted to ask you about your choice to write books for children. Yeah, so... I find that when children understand something about what's happening in their brains and in their bodies, it helps them to be more open to using the skills and techniques that we can teach them. Mm -hmm. So I think that in the same way that you try to demystify the brain for adults, we can do that for kids and teens as well. And it helps them yeah. to be more receptive then. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. And I think that you bring in some incredible kind of metaphors and ideas. It, it's really genius the way that you do that. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think teenagers are slightly harder to reach perhaps in that way, aren't they? Um, because your your books are really aimed at the younger age group, aren't they? They are. My books are primarily for kids in the 6 to 12-year-old age range. And one of the things mm. that's trickier about teens is I think they tend to be more defensive. Um, you know, they don't want anyone to suggest that there's anything wrong with them. And so it might be harder in some ways um, to, to teach these things to kids. But, you know, teens have a greater capacity to understand as well. So you know, there's there's kind of a trade-off. But what I think is so beautiful about your books is that you capitalize on the idea of that, that young people are, are, are motivated in middle childhood to use some of the skills and take some of the ideas from their parents, actually, um, whereas teens might be pulling away from their parents. And so, it's a, as you say, it's a finer art in some ways. But you just take right. the, the enthusiasm that young people in middle childhood have to sort of take advice and take an idea from a, an older adult and use it with such creativity. It's just wonderful to read. It's huge, huge um, inspiration for us, certainly. And we, when we were reading, writing the Teenage Brain book, we, our voice was very clearly to the adults, so whether that be parents or teens. In our new book, we took a slightly different approach. So we've got a shared experience. So parents and young people look at the book together. Now, your voice is directed mm. at young people, taking that, um, that creativity and speaking straight to them. But of course, there's still a role for parents in that relationship with the book. Um, it's all about relationships, as we say. So what is it that right. the adults can do to support whether that's explicitly or implicitly while young people are learning the skills that are described in your book? Yeah, I think that my books work best when they're read by a child and a parent or other supportive adult together. 
And I agree with you that parents still have a huge role to play. It's important for parents themselves to understand what's going on in their child's brain, what's going on emotionally with their child. And then it's important for parents both to model the use of the skill set and to coach their kids in using it. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think parents play a really key role here. Yeah, I love what you say. We couldn't agree more. Modeling is so important. And part of it, I think one of the wonderful things is by talking about these things in those early years, before the teen years, it normalizes this idea, actually, that we all have, you know, emotional health, just like we have physical health, it goes up and down. And I think that really reduces that defensiveness. And if that comes about in teenage years, it's really hard to overcome, Mm. isn't it? One of the things that I really try to work with parents on is learning how to tolerate their children's big feelings or strong Mm. feelings. You know, I think for all of us, um, strong feelings can be really disconcerting. And, you know, whether we feel the feeling ourselves or we're witnessing it on the part of our child, there's this impulse to just make the feeling go away. So I work primarily with anxiety and it definitely happens with anxiety that, you know, anxiety kind of rears its head and everyone just wants it to go away. And so parents get busy reassuring or placating or accommodating their anxious child. And they're doing that in a well-intentioned way. You know, they see that their child is suffering and they want to relieve the suffering, but it's that accommodation that actually locks the worry into place. And so for parents to learn how to not accommodate, the very first step is learning how to just tolerate the feeling, Um, you know, so to empathize with with your child, you know, I can see that you feel worried, or I can see that you're scared or nervous or whatever it is, you know, we want parents to kind of label the feeling and empathize with it and validate Mm. it and help their child to ride it out rather than scrambling to try to make the feeling go away. And that's part of what teaches kids ultimately to better tolerate their own feelings, right? And you write about that beautifully, about the idea again in the book, and we imagine parents almost on the shoulder of the young person saying, you just sit with it and notice it right. and it's okay. And that, you know, that position is such a powerful one. And it's something that we, you know, we know from that there's some wonderful data. I'm sure you're aware of that, about the the data where um, if we're with somebody who we trust and they might name a distressing feeling, that our brain activity drops, basically our brain distress drops. So actually saying, right. I think you're feeling anxious and, and modeling a sense of calm about that is an intervention in itself and that's so well described in a variety of your books but um outsmarting worry in particular that certainly nails it doesn't it yeah because one of the things that we want um i think both children and parents to understand is that anxiety is hugely uncomfortable but just Mm. because you're afraid doesn't necessarily mean that you're in danger it feels like you're in danger but you're often not. And, you know, there's a notion of a false alarm when you get sort of a, um, a trigger, you know, an, an amygdala alert, um, and you feel like you're in imminent danger. And I think when kids under, have an understanding that there is this alarm system in the brain and it can get set off, but we're not always actually in danger, that helps kids better be able to ride it out because they understand, I, I have false alarms, maybe this is one of those false alarms, and they, they can do one of the things that they can be taught how to do um, in, that calms the brain so that they can get back to their logical thinking and you know figure out how to kind of navigate mm-hmm. the situation more successfully. Yeah, I actually had a parent recently who she did actually literally say to me, can something terrible happen to her when she has a panic attack? Mm -hmm. You know, could everything stop working? And so I really hear what you say. The parent has to believe it. Right. You don't they? And and then the child can believe it, too. And actually, one of the genius things I think about your book, a bit like many of the kind of Disney and Pixar films, is that it really makes this information accessible to parents as well. Mm -hmm. 
you know yeah. a lot of parents are not going to pick up a you know 50,000 word textbook <laughs> right so right. I love that um yeah. you know I enjoyed reading it I'm sure adults enjoy reading it too I was just gonna say I think part of the fun of writing is figuring out analogies or metaphors yeah. that are going to make sense for people you know that that help people to recognize oh I get it or I understand mm. that concept um, and so you know an example that relates to what we're talking about is comparing the amygdala the part of the brain that that senses danger and alerts us to danger comparing that to a smoke detector and you know we have smoke detectors in our house to alert us if there's a fire but actually smoke detectors aren't tuned to fire they're tuned to smoke and smoke happens for lots of reasons so the alarm is going to blare in the case of a fire but it's also going to blare if there's toast that's getting overdone or candles burning too close to the smoke detector the fire is a real emergency the toast caught in the toaster is not an emergency. It's a false alarm, right? But it's the same alarm mm -hmm. that sounds either way, right? And so people, mm -hmm. you know, have an experience, have experiences with a smoke detector going off when there is no fire. So they understand that notion of a false alarm. And we can help them understand that our amygdalas are like that. The amygdala sounds the alarm. It sure feels like there's something actually happening here, but it's a false alarm. Um, and coming up with those kinds of analogies, I it, it, I think it's fun. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. That was one of our, our questions, actually, is how do you come up with these analogies? Because, of course, it really plays beautifully to the developmental stage of middle childhood, that personification of ideas and using concrete examples and the visual metaphor is just, you know, it's perfectly lands in that, you know, the elementary school or primary school spot beautifully. And you're incredibly creative with it. Where do they come from? How do you how do you develop those? I I think it's just a way of kind of looking at the world and noticing things. You know, I when I work with children in person, I'm I'm really thinking hard about how can I get this child to understand this concept it's you know typically a cognitive behavioral concept how can i map it onto their experience um and i don't know the ideas just come into my mind i don't know quite how that happens um but i try to think about you know the kinds of things that kids encounter in their everyday lives and then to use those as examples to help them understand uh brain mechanics yeah mm, it's the creativity in you I imagine with you've got the creative yes. Yes. and the you, language together. Yeah. They come together beautifully. It's so yeah. great. And, you know, I have the benefit of working with children and I see which of these analogies work and lead to ahas for kids and which ones kind of fall flat so I can yep. test it before I put it into a book. Right. And so mm -hmm. only the very best of these make their way into my books. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about individual differences, isn't it? Because, you know, some kids, I think, will eagerly pick a book up like this. Um, they want to know how their brains work. They want to know how to manage their feelings. And some kids are actually much more resistant to it. Mm -hmm. What Do you have any advice for parents to think about how they can engage kids who might need a book like yours, but they won't read it? Yeah, I think it's hugely important to normalize. Um, you know, kids are just so sensitive to anyone suggesting that there's something wrong with them. And so, you know, I think that's the starting point that parents really need to normalize what's going on, to, to not blame or criticize or, you know, come across as overly worried about what's happening, right? And then mm, I think it's also important for parents to use the language that their kids use. So, you know, parents might talk about anxiety or with younger kids, they might talk about worry and, and kids might say, I'm not worried. Um, because that's not the way they experience it. So if a child is instead yeah. saying I'm stressed or I just don't like, you know, whatever it is, uh, parents need to echo that language and not get into a debate about semantics, um, you know, to kind of res respect their child's experience. 
um, uh, you know, some children are going to remain resistant or defensive. There's still plenty that parents can do because when the parents themselves understand um, how feelings are fueled, how anxiety gets locked into place, and parents learn how to move away from accommodations, that's going to kind of force change on a child's part. So there are models of treatment that are are based exclusively on educating and coaching parents. The kids aren't directly involved at all. And those models are used when kids are just, you know, not able to kind of step towards this themselves. But you take a model of empowerment, which I think is so wonderful. You know, if a kid is ready to take that, it skills that will, you know, that toolkit will last a lifetime, no matter right. what the what the issue. So, you know, I think I think you're right. You know, there can be a position where perhaps a young person needs a different model. But if they can take that idea and 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 take, as you say, start from the position where the young person is, you know, this bothers me when I'm a bit stressed. We'll take that. There's your chink of light and right. go with that and start. Right. And who knows where, you know, once they start to understand how it could change their life, they right. may go all the way. So it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And I think also that, you know, parents can keep in mind that they often have to um, take small steps. So, um, you know, I think that sometimes parents initiate a conversation with their child about their feelings or about coping skills and kids snap at them or are resistant and parents back off. Um, and it's important to mm -hmm. kind of approach and reapproach and, you know, just kind of keep working at it over and over and over again with kids rather than be put off by an initial negative reaction. Yeah, and I think there's a generational shift. I mean, there definitely is, isn't there, in terms of talking about emotions, understanding your own internal world. Yes. And for a lot of us parents, that wasn't something that was talked about at all when we were children. And now right. it is talked about. Yes, in schools as well. Yeah. You know, social emotional learning curriculums. Yeah. And, yeah. So I think sometimes parents feel a bit out of their depth. Like, is it okay to talk about these things or, you know, or they don't eat, they don't have a model. They don't have an experience of mm -hmm. how to do it because it wasn't really done with them. Right. Or yeah, even a fear thing... sometimes, sorry, I was going to say even a fear sometimes of, of if you ask the question or talk about it, it will create a greater problem. That's exactly what I was going to say. So one of the things I see a lot with parents of anxious children is they're reluctant to bring up the anxiety when their child isn't in an anxious moment because they don't want to trigger them. So they yeah. wait until their child is anxious. And once their child is in a panic, they are not receptive to learning. You know, their thinking mm -hmm. brain is offline and that's absolutely not the time to teach. So part of the work with parents is helping them kind of be brave about broaching these topics and, you know, talking to their kids about anxiety or whatever the, the feeling is that a child is having trouble with at a time when things are calm. Um, yeah. And, you know, if that yeah. triggers them, it triggers them. If, if just talking about anxiety triggers the anxiety, that's really a sign that a child needs help with their anxiety. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, talk about it when it's not a problem. I really agree. Mm -hmm. but there are all these terms that I don't know you will probably have heard of, but many people may not have done like emotional granularity. So understanding mm -hmm. the difference in how you're feeling or emo diversity. Mm -hmm. I saw there's a, um, there's a website about an emo thesaurus. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Yeah. So it's just such a field that's just suddenly opened up uh -huh. in a new way. And it's like, wow, we really are suddenly talking about emotions. It's, it's right. so great. And one of the things that I think is really important, this might be more of an issue with, with my age group than teens, but people sometimes use really generic terms for feelings. Like they might say, mm. I feel upset, right? And they might use that to mean, I feel sad, I feel frustrated, I feel disappointed, I feel stressed. And those are very mm. different things, right? Yeah. Because how you're going to cope if you're frustrated is different from what you need to do if you're sad or if you're disappointed yeah. or if you're jealous, right? And so I think that we want to encourage both kids and parents to learn how to be accurate and specific about their feelings because that suggests coping. Absolutely. Then. 
and also talking about these negative feelings, as you as you said, is sometimes a, a, a big step. You know, for a parent mm-hmm. to say, "I felt jealous" or "I felt mad," mm-hmm. can sometimes, in, in the initial stages, feel a bit unusual. But actually, making the 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 leap to do that, you're actually modelling that you're you're owning it, and all these emotions happen. We might not strive right. to feel jealous, but for sure, we'll feel jealous. And we'll figure it yes. out. Um, and so by naming all these, you know, using the granulati- granulality um, of all these different emotions, it, it really helps articulate every state that the young person will feel. Um, from a parental point of view, um, you're the, uh, you know, modeling is the most powerful way of, of starting that emotional awareness. Um, the bad right. stuff, the ugly emotions, the embarrassing emotions, it's all part of our capacity to become self-aware. Yeah. And it's really helping kids think about, you know, kind of their relationship that they have with their own feelings. You know, I think one of the things that when we were writing, uh, we've written a book and um, that's due out called Incredible Conversations, which is all about parents having conversations with their kids. And we were just struck when we were doing the research about the incredible, overwhelming evidence, really, about the impact that strong relationships have on life and income and education. I suppose, in a way, what you're talking about here and what we're talking about and what you talk about in your books is the relationship kids have with their own feelings. Right. That's so important, isn't it? And the value yes. of that. And one of the things that we do, especially with younger kids, is to personify feelings. Mm. So, you know, there's a wonderful movie called Inside Out that I think <laughs> does this just beautifully. Um, most of the movie takes place inside a child's head and you see each feeling as a little character. And we can do a version of that with kids. Um, I definitely do it with anxiety. So I help kids to envision a worry creature of some sort. And um, I want them to have conversations with that worry creature and to um, question what it's telling them and to push back against it, not immediately obey it. Um, So yeah, I definitely want kids to be developing a relationship, changing their relationship with their feelings. You also use, is it quite a CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy kind of model, don't you, in your books? Yes, yes, So it's identifying the feeling and then... And maybe you could just say a little about that. Yeah. So CBT is based on the idea that there's an internal triangle that's made up of our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. And those are all related to one another. And often we have difficulty because our feelings are distressing to us, but we can't directly change our feelings. What we can do is we can work on the thoughts that are contributing to the feelings and the actions that both rise out of and also link back to our feelings. So when we work on changing our thoughts and changing our actions, that leads to changes in feelings. Um, Teenagers actually, I think, are better able to understand that triangle. Young kids have a little more trouble stepping to the side of themselves and thinking about their own thoughts. Um, That's a a skill that develops at around age nine to be able to think about your own thinking. Um, But even with younger kids, we can help them to do this kind of personification of their feelings and questioning of their feelings. Um, And yeah, there are, so CBT skills are things like um, questioning your thoughts, looking for evidence of the things that you're thinking, um, desensitizing, so like learning to step towards something that's scary or uncomfortable for you. And my books teach CBT techniques in a very direct way, but in a way way that um, is understandable to kids. For sure. You talk in, a, in using beautiful language about worry with on uppercase and lowercase worry. And mm-hmm. making that differentiation is very interesting because it would be hard to articulate exactly why that works so beautifully, but it does. It, you know, how the domination of an uppercase worry. And, and so kids can immediately identify with that to say, yes, well, my worry, maybe that is uppercase. Maybe it's taken over a little bit. So I think that even although the concepts, as you say, you know, some CBT concepts are probably rather complex for, you know, the younger end of middle childhood. 
But many of the ideas can be grasped and you, if they're described and communicated in a, you know, in a, an identifiable way, which is certainly what your, what your books do with some elegance, I have to say. Uh, we have some envy, Bettina. I think we'll have to own our envy here. Yeah. And say, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, we could feel that very much. Um, really, but really, you know, rather inspirational stuff. Um, I'm just thinking about, Bettina, is it, you know, with an eye on the time, should we go for our last hurrah? Mm-hmm. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A last hurrah question. Now, we, you know, we're fairly early on in our writing careers. We've, we've written two books together now. We've learned something about the literature, absolutely, the science. But also, I think we learn about ourselves as we write a book. It's a process, I guess. You've written so many books now. You may have this down to fine art. You're at mastery level. <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> is there, um, from a sort of process point of view, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what you've learned in the process of writing, and perhaps if we have the opportunity to think about what's going to be your next project and how will you embrace that one? Yes. So my next book is The Sibling Survival Guide that's coming out in June of this year. And then I'm actually working on a new series. So I have a four book series called Dr. Dawn's mini books about mighty fears. And those are books (laughs) um, that are each addressing a specific phobia or manifestation of anxiety for the six to 10 year old age group. And um, one of the things that I really like doing is finding a format for a book, like these new series Um, even though the topics are different, there's the same format. And um, so I like thinking about what's an effective way to teach children a concept. And then you can plug different, you know, in this case, it's different phobias, use the same, um, you know, kind of format uh, to be teaching that. Um, So my process has very much to do with kind of juggling or, or looking at two things at once. What is it that I'm trying to get across and what's going to be an effective way to do that? Um, and I just, I find that invigorating, challenging, frustrating, fun, um, all of that wrapped up at once to just figure out how do I get this across in a way that Um, is going to make sense to a child. I really want to be empowering kids. So I I want the kids who read my books to feel good about themselves, to feel competent, to feel like they can understand, they can be effective. So I'm always trying to think about how do I um, normalize? How do I add just little touches of humor? How do I help kids see themselves Mm. in the books that I'm writing? Um, and I just find that a really rewarding, um, interesting, fun thing to do. Yeah. You know, I, th- I think I'm a natural mm-hmm. writer. I guess I'm, I have the benefit of being a natural writer. So it, it, that doesn't feel like a struggle to me. It feels like a puzzle that I enjoy working out. Well, we all benefit enormously from that, Dawn. Your <laughs> Thank books you. are just amazing. I've so looked forward to those. I really do. Um, it's wonderful. Um, it's interesting. I was just um, listening to um, a really interesting podcast about adult neuroplasticity, actually. And they were talking about how hard it is for adults to change their brains. It's very mm. easy for kids. Mm-hmm. And saying that in order to do that, we have when we get in that frustration zone, you have to stay in it for seven to 30 minutes. <laughs> mm, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. So we all want to just stop, don't we, at that point when it gets really frustrating, but that's where you can make the change happen. The analogy that I use with kids um, when I'm talking about neuroplasticity is that of sledding, like in the winter time, and talking mm. about going down a hill and carving a path. You know, if you're the first one going down a hill in a deep new snow, I the first like run that. down does not go well. You're needing to work at it. And you get to the bottom of the hill, you go back up, you go back down the second time, same path, it's easier. And you go again and again and again to carve a path for yourself. And so when kids are working on something new, they're carving that path. Um, And it makes sense that it's Mm -hmm. hard because it's a new path and you have to stick with it to get it to be Mm. slick and to get it to be more automatic. 
and that that maps onto our brain paths, our neural paths. And I think that's the joy of of these concepts about the humanity you really bring to some, you know, pretty basic science for a young person. Mm -hmm. Um, I love the way you're talking about, you know, having the balance between having a format and a template almost, you know, this is what I've got to get across to the young person and how am I, can I inhabit it? in a way mm-hmm. that makes sense to them. And I think we could certainly identify with that, Bettina. Can we, you know, once we once we found the format for um, the incredible book, certainly, we said, aha, okay, now we can inhabit it and deliver yeah. the the you know some quite quite tricky neuroscience with some humanity. And that was that was our that was our aim too. So I think that's partly why we feel so inspired about the the way that you deliver um, similarly pretty, you know, pretty complex ideas with mm-hmm. absolute um with a joy that that I think young people pick up on and I I suspect that's partly why the books are so successful yes yes Dawn thank you so so much for taking the time to talk to us today um it's been such a rich conversation um it's been so so good to talk to you and um thanks everybody for listening um please do look up dawn's books if you don't have them already i've I've literally got all of them on my bookshelf um (laughs) and um yeah do follow us jane and i uh use the handle incredible conversation on social media um incredible convo on twitter and uh we love having incredible conversations of all types and forms with fabulous people like dawn so do come and join us there in the next podcast episode we discuss how to support trauma and difficult experiences using practical ideas that will be useful for organizations or family life with the unstoppable karen traceman clinical psychologist trainer and author of many books but most recently a treasure box for creating trauma-informed organizations thank you very much